The House will vote today on a resolution that both censures Congressman Paul Gosar and removes him from the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform for posting an edited anime video on Twitter that depicted him killing AOC. AOC is also on that committee. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who had previously called for a criminal investigation of Gosar, explained why the House was taking this action. Take a listen. Because he made threats, uh, 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 suggestions about harming a member of Congress, that is an insult not only an endangerment of that member of Congress, but an insult to the institution of the House of Representatives. We cannot have members joking about murdering each other, as well as threatening the President of the United States. According to The Hill, Congressman Gosar said that he did not mean to promote violence when he posted the video and stressed that he doesn't support violence against fellow members and pointed to his swift removal of the video following backlash. Meanwhile, AOC alleged that Gosar and other Republicans are, quote, essentially using a national platform to legitimize threats of violence on lower levels and on the local levels to intimidate people from participating in democracy. Team Rising joins us to discuss. Max Alvarez is the host of Working People Podcast and Editor-in-Chief at The Real News. Philip Wegman is a White House reporter for Real Clear Politics. Welcome to you both. Morning, Thanks, guys. So, Philip, break down this uh, censure vote for us. Uh, or should we just expect a straight-up party lines kind of deal? Well, Robbie, thank you for not asking me to break down the anime vote, the anime video that started all of this. <laughs> it's really a pretty ridiculous uh, saga in Congress right now. I'm not sure why Representative Gozar um, thought that it was a good idea to post that video. Uh, he's had a, a rather unusual uh, Twitter history, to say the least. And uh, I think the Democrats, you know, they saw uh, that this was you know, inappropriate behavior. And they're going to hold him accountable. I mean, we've got reports the other day of uh, Gozar behind closed doors trying to explain to the GOP caucus you know, what, what was behind his thinking. Um, it's truly bizarre. And uh, I think that uh, today uh, it's likely going to be a party line vote where the Republicans are probably going to, um, you know, probably going to protest that, that uh, you know, Gozar wasn't trying to actually you know, cause any harm or, or make any real threat. Um, but it's, it's a really bizarre, weird position uh, for anyone to have to be in uh, to explain why a, a grown man, uh, let alone a member of Congress, was uh, watching a, a weird anime video with his head superimposed over a character who was fighting other anime characters. I mean, like, this is stupid. There's no other way to get around it. This is just dumb. <laughs> yes, no doubt. Uh, Max, if Republicans, uh, well, ev eventually, when Republicans take the House of Representatives, how do you th how do you think this is going to continue to play out? I, I would I, I could certainly see a, a situation where this becomes tit for tat, and eventually nobody on the squad, uh, except maybe Anna Presley, you know, has a committee seat anywhere. Yeah, that, that's exactly where I see this going. I mean, like you know, I and it, it's kind of like this. Catch twenty two, right? I mean, because uh, I <laughs> have railed often against Democrats for not using tools at their disposal to, you know, suggest that they are actually taking any political threats from the right um, seriously. And the response is always, you know, like, oh well, we don't want to break the norms. You know, it's going to turn into a kind of all out war. I, th I mean, like, you know, there, there is something to be said there because that's what we've seen happen, you know, time and time again. That's probably what's going to happen here. But at the same time, it's like, what's the other option? Like, do nothing? Like, I was actually surprised. Um, or not surprised, but maybe just kind of a little taken aback when I was looking into this. Um, because this is a very kind of Trumpian move, right? Remember when he had the wrestling thing where he, he superimposed CNN's yes. face on someone and he was beating them up? Right. I mean, like, it's it, as we already said, it's dumb. You know, it's silly. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, it isn't a signal to people uh, who, you know, will actually take it as a sort of call to action. And I think that those numbers are kind of borne out. You know, the L.A. Times reported earlier this year that in 2016, Capitol Police investigated 902 threats on on Congress. In 2018, that number was over 5,000. In 2020, it was over 8,000, closer to 9,000. So I'm like, crap, well, okay. Apparently, you know, a lot of people are taking this stuff seriously and they're kind of like taking it 
into their own hands. So I don't think that this is going to be solved by each party kind of censoring each other. I think that um, just like in 2016 and in 2020, we are seeing kind of very clear signs of a society that is unwell. Uh, and we are refusing to kind of actually do anything about it or find any sort of of substantive solution that doesn't just kind of revolve around, you know, partisan up, one-upsmanship. One Republican that's come out in support of censoring Gosar is none other than Liz Cheney, who told reporters that McCarthy's inaction on Gosar is quite indefensible morally and ethically, and it's crazy politically. You, you know, there, uh, uh, Philip, I feel like they're... Maybe this is maybe this isn't correct, but I it, it feels like there used to be more sort of internal gatekeeping in the parties or keeping people in line, and now that's that's definitely doesn't take place on the right. I mean, maybe because of the primary system, in you know, in some places the Republicans have elected the voters have elected, you know, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, others, and and you, the the party doesn't have as much control over them. Maybe you can you can probably make the case that some of the ideological Logical disagreements uh, between squad type people and the mainstream on the Democratic side. I think it's a quite not quite the same dynamic. But um, is this a evidence of sort of declining uh, a party strength or party steering? That certainly could be one takeaway. You could see in a different system where you have strong parties and where you have uh, party leadership that knows how to wield its power that you would make certain. Uh, that members of Congress don't step out of line, um, not just on on uh, you know different policy positions, but also uh, in their behavior. Um, and what is interesting is that this is not the first time that the Gozar has posted something kind of bizarre online and has embarrassed Republicans. Uh, this isn't the first time Republicans have sort of said, you know, why are you doing this? And so, you know, if there was a stronger party leadership. Um, then, then maybe some of this could have been prevented. But uh, you know, to Cheney's last point there, um, I think that even the Republicans who are defending Gozar and saying, hey, this, this isn't some sort of uh, coded message, this is just you know, a, you know, a bizarre, silly mistake, um, this, is, this is kind of a stink bomb uh, at a moment you know, when they should be, you know, rallying uh, against Biden, when they should be sort of laying out their case for you know, what it is different that they're going to be doing uh, w when they get uh, a majority next year, um, if the elections go their way. Instead, they're not doing that. Um, and instead, uh, we're, we're focusing on, you know, uh, Gozar's Twitter habits instead of, you know, what Republicans uh, want to do when they get control of, of Congress again. And I, I think that, I mean, look, um, Paul Ryan used to talk all the time about Republicans having to prove that they could govern. And thus far, I mean, this episode doesn't tell you anything about what they would do if they were back in control, does it? Yeah, Max, I, I think there's a lot to draw from what Philip is saying about our, the current state of our politics. And part of it is the difference between the two parties. Like re Republicans aren't really capable of of or, or you know, aren't interested in kind of policing their own side anymore. But Democrats have shown they know how to do this. You know, when Ilhan Omar posted something about Benjamins uh, that that Kevin McCarthy got upset about, that APAC got upset about, uh, you know, Democrats across the board said this was anti-Semitic. You've got to take this down. And they were they were ready to take her, their own you know colleague, to this to the House floor and censure her. Even as Republicans say what Gosar did is wrong, they're not willing to go forward and, and do this and do the same thing. They could, they could diffuse this in an interesting way by all voting with Democrats and being like, yeah, you know what, this was messed up. Like, this is not, this, this, guy's, this guy's cray. We're, we're voting along with this resolution. We don't, we don't endorse this. Um, instead, it does seem like they're gonna pick this fight, which is reminiscent of, I mean, different, different issues, but you know, when, de when Democrats were passing the American Rescue Plan, all Republicans wanted to talk about was Dr. Seuss. And so now as Democrats are pushing through Build Back Better, you know, they're, they're going to be talking about this and whatever other cultural issue they come up with throughout the, throughout the rest of the week, with, which goes to Philip's point that, you know, what, what would they do if they were in office? Right. And I mean, you know, the sad reality is that they do it because it works, right? Um, you know, I think that... Um, 
you know, it speaks to, uh, I think, the larger problem that is kind of the elephant in the room here, right? Because in terms of what Congress is going to do, in terms of what politicians in general, the two parties are going to do, right? They're, they're, is a very sort of limited set of solutions here and everyone is basically in this sort of political Mexican standoff where they have all their guns pointed at one another. Um, but ultimately, it's very obvious to say, but ultimately each party's side is to win, not to govern, right? And I think that I want to kind of uh, clarify something that I said earlier, like because I do think that politicians should be held accountable by their constituents. I do think Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema and others should have to face the constituents that they're screwing over and have to answer for their decisions, yada, 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 right? That is you know, necessary for democracy. But like when you have like this kind of what we always call polarization, where people's way of sort of engaging uh, with their politicians is to threaten to kill them or to actually try to kill them. Again, that is a sign of a society that's not doing so hot. And we're also by no means the only society that is experienced to at least two sides being at each other's throats, right? I mean, this is this is one of the rules of history. When you see this kind of violence, it's usually because there are deeper structural issues and people aren't being taken care of. Society itself is not addressing its contradictions, and then violence sort of um, boils over. And what I think, um, you know, I know people often roll their eyes, you know, like when I when I go off on tangents about the importance of things outside of D.C., like political realms, like the labor movement, like social movements, like organizing with the tenants in your building. Right. And people think that it's just because I'm a crazy Marxist. And, yeah, that's part of it. Right. But the other part of it. Right, is that politics, as it is constructed in this country, by definition, is meant to pit us against one another. And that is each party's M.O., right, is to ultimately convince you that there are enough enemies on the other side that you should be siding with Democrats or Republicans. And yet the problems that continue to ail us uh, go unsolved really by either party. The reason that I stress the importance of things like organizing in your workplace or in your buildings is because you are forced to uh, work together with people who may be wildly have wildly different political opinions than you, but you have to work around a shared set of concerns like improving working conditions, getting better pay, so on and so mm. forth. That is really important for us to actually sort of learn how to live together. But uh, official politics in D.C. and the kind of corporate media that has a vested interest in stoking this kind of quote unquote polarization is not going to provide a way for us to be together. It's only going to provide a way for us to continually be separated. Indeed. Max and Philip, thank you so yeah, much well for said. joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We have more Rising coming up right after this.